Hey everybody, now I'd like to talk a little bit to you guys about, we're going to do Drones 102, a little bit more information. We've talked about 101, which is basically some of the basic information about drones, and then kind of choosing your first one, the various sizes, but now there's, this is kind of the technical aspects. So we're going to go into 102, um, there's actually some rules, uh, the F, FAA is starting to kind of discover some rules, so these are changing kind of as we go along, and different waivers may kind of apply to some of these different rules, more in the future, but right now, on the FAA site, you can see the UAS part 107 uh, you can find the link in the description below but basically this is what tells you all of the current uh, laws with the FAA and these drones or multi rotors or unmanned aerial aircrafts uh, sometimes there's different terms that people are using for those uh, but basically there's some really uh, simple things you know you need to keep them under 400 feet uh, there could be you know real actual full-scale flying aircraft out there you need to yield to them uh, you also have to keep them within line of sight so that you can see it and everything uh, there's also rules about keeping everything under 55 pounds total payload and uh, you have to keep it under 100 miles per hour uh, there's all sorts of different laws there as far as like locations to airports you need to stay like uh, I think five miles away from airports um, as far as keeping away from certain things there's also air maps that you need to know because there's certain zones that are restricted for flying these things especially like I mentioned um, certain distances from airports um, also some national parks uh, there's also sometimes temporary air restrictions like if if the president's coming to town or something like that or if someone important is in town or something special is going on uh, so you can actually go online and find out what those restricted zones are you can type US airspace maps uh, in Google I'll also provide a link to that below so if you guys have any questions about where you can fly and where you can't fly uh, just make sure you know before you fly when you start flying also in order to fly lawfully you have to in some cases have a ham radio license uh, they're pretty easy to get it's uh, you have to take some tests uh, you can go online it's really easy to find you know how to register for those basically uh, if you're flying anything uh, that is or or you're transmitting a signal at, at any frequency and it doesn't have that FCC certification on it I mean mileage may vary depending on what country you're in but here in the US we have FCC part 15 uh, and uh, all of that information can be found online as well I'll provide a link for that also uh, but basically most of these if you're flying just the regular uh, aircraft by itself most of those have been uh, certified most of these radio transmitters and all of that have like usually your transmitter itself will have been FC certified you can see on this on the back there's that FCC symbol there this one's been certified but most of the FPV equipment uh, has not been certified so chances are if you're doing anything FPV 5.8 gigahertz or any other frequency you're gonna have to have a ham radio license in order to lawfully participate in this um, there's also different frequencies that you can use for uh, for doing these. Most of these systems come at 5.8 gigahertz. 5.8 doesn't penetrate trees and buildings very well, so if you want a little bit more ability to uh, penetrate objects, you can go to lower frequencies. Um, there's different ham radio license requirements for different uh, frequencies uh, in some cases and different power levels. So make sure your power levels are within the FCC requirements and just make sure you have all necessary licenses. Another thing you want to consider is AMA. AMA stands for the Academy of Model Aeronautics. They've been around for a long time and basically if you're flying RC airplanes, RC helicopters, uh, multi-rotors, whatever it is, it's, it's basically insurance. Uh, they have a great insurance plan set up. It's about $50 a year. Uh, most events that you go to require you to have a AMA number. Uh, so once you get into this hobby, it's pretty much inevitable. You need to get that. And it's also just a good plan. It's just like any insurance. And it, there have been cases where people have had problems and then they submit a ticket to the AMA and it's actually financially covered. Uh, so definitely get signed up for your AMA. Get your AMA number right away if you're thinking of getting into this hobby. Also, back to the whole FAA registration, you know, make sure you register your stuff. Basically, if it weighs more than two sticks of butter, then you're going to have to, I mean, anything, any size, and this size, this size, they all weigh more than two sticks of butter. So you're going to have to get a number and you have to get a number, a number and have it visible um, on everything that you're flying. Also, I think the AMA is trying to work with them to try to get the AMA number working as the FAA registration number, but at this time, that's not certified, so uh, maybe later, maybe by the time you see that this that is the case, just make sure you're checking the current laws. Another thing with most of these drones is that they've usually got a GPS positioning thing in it. Uh, a lot of the new ones, they will actually be programmed to keep you under 400 feet and certain distances away from no-fly zones, um, but not all of them have that, so don't depend on that.
But one advantage of the whole GPS thing is that you can have a fail safe. A lot of them, if they lose a signal or, or you know, your transmitter dies, a lot of them have this, they locate the home uh, spot where you first start up and fire it up and then they locate some GPS uh, satellite signals and they can come safely to home. Uh, so, you know, if you have fail safes, try to get those uh, programmed into uh, whatever you're flying. Also, these things usually run on LiPo batteries. LiPo stands for lithium polymer. Uh, lithium polymer is, uh, it's a great technology as far as batteries. We can keep the weight down, uh, we can keep the power high, they handle some pretty high current draw, but safety is a huge factor. Uh, LiPo batteries can be very volatile, so make sure you're charging them at the proper charge rate. Uh, most of them are 1C, some of them can do 3C or 5C. Basically, a C is, if it's 1000 milliamp hours, the size of the pack, you can charge it at one current. Make sure you read what it says on the side of the lithium polymer battery. Make sure you're charging it with the proper kind of charger under the proper kind of battery technology. For example, uh, make sure you don't charge a lithium polymer battery at uh, NICAD uh, chemistry settings. Also, make sure you store your lithium polymer batteries safely. It's always some people get metal cans, uh, some people get lithium polymer bags for when they're charging them. Uh, just know that anytime you short uh, two cells on a lithium pol polymer pack, it's probably going to start on fire. So it's, if you're working with metal cans, if you're putting in metal cans, make sure there's some sort of lining so that you're not also causing a short between the connections because a connection on a LiPo battery is going to go pop pretty quick. So be safe with those, learn everything you can about LiPo safety, and don't let your house burn down because of this. Okay, so that's it for kind of the nitty gritty, the things that you need to know about multi-rotors and um, these flying aircrafts. Hopefully that uh, makes a difference and helps for you guys. If you have any questions, uh, again, feel free to put something in the comments below, uh, or if there's anything else that you think I should add to the 103 video, uh, just let us know. Thanks for watching everybody, and feel free to like and subscribe, and we'll see you later.